thank you very much for coming. You look good, so I'm glad you came here. Uh, uh, I'm Marty Kaplan. I'm the director of the Norman Lear Center, which is part of the USC Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism. If you don't know about the Lear Center, or if you'd like to know more, there uh, is a pile of uh, brochures just outside. Please pick them up uh, in, in the briefest possible way. The mission of the Lear Center is to study the impact of media and entertainment on society and to shape the impact of media and entertainment on society. So it is both for research and for meddling, intervention, trying to make things better and, uh, and doing it in innovative ways. And uh, we hope that uh, it's something that might interest you. There's lots of uh, room for people to contribute to the work that we do. Um, six years ago, people who uh, in the Annenberg community were kind of shocked to hear that uh, Ev Rogers, who had been uh, some years before associate dean of this school, and uh, the, he held a Walter Annenberg professorship, and uh, was uh, an illustrious star that he had died. And uh, in his honor, uh, a, an award was created by the then dean, Jeff Cowan. We're in the Jeffrey Cowan Forum. Uh, in, as a way to memorialize Ed's contributions. Ed was an amazing scholar. Uh, one of the books that he wrote, The uh, uh, Diffusion of Innovation, is as it turns out, the second most cited book in the social sciences. Amazing contribution. But he also was involved in an area called entertainment education. And it was a great passion of his, and he brought that work here uh, while he was here and after he was here as well. If you don't know what entertainment education is, you'll be finding out about it today uh, in, the, in the shortest possible way uh, Entertainment serves as an accidental curriculum. Entertainment education is a way to add intention to entertainment so that what it does is not just making money and making people enjoy themselves, it also can be used for lots of purposes. The Lear Center has a program which focuses on entertainment <coughs> education. Its name is Hollywood Health and Society. That program administers this Rogers Award, and I would like to recognize all at once uh, the people who are part of that program that uh, I want to acknowledge and thank for their work as part of the staff. Sandra de Castro Buffington is the director of the program, and we have in here fresh from uh, the East Coast, uh, several of our funders from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. We are so grateful for the contributions you make to make our work possible. So please join me in thanking them and the staff. So the uh, Rogers Prize is, uh, the winner is selected by a jury. And the chair of that jury is uh, a man who was dean of this school, uh, a colleague of Ev Rogers, and he in turn is going to introduce the award recipient. So, Peter Clark. Thank you, Martin. I just want to add uh, a note about Ev, who I knew very, very well from the time we met in 1965. I know I don't look that old. <laughs> Um, and uh, uh, when Marty mentioned that uh, this fusion of innovations is the second most cited book in social sciences, he's not kidding, but let me give you um, a, a metric for that. Um, it has been cited now just under 30,000 times. And those of you who are familiar with citation indexes in scholarship will recognize that that is an extraordinary number. Um, Ev's work uh, in entertainment <coughs> education, as distinguished from diffusion of innovations, um, has uh, uh, 
been fueled by many, many people. A couple of them are in this room, and I, I want to recognize them uh, because uh, they not only have fueled uh, Ev's contributions to this field, but they themselves have made extraordinary contributions of their own. One of them is David Poindexter, who himself is a former recipient of the Ev Rogers uh, Award, and Sonny Fox, who is West Coast Vice President of uh, Population Communication International, and he was very instrumental in uh, putting together the funding that enabled Ev to do the signature work that he did in Tanzania, which remains to this day uh, some of the most compelling empirical evidence of the value of entertainment education in the developing world. So please join me in recognizing them. Well, this year's work by the judging committee uh, was really quite easy, and it, it gets, just gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, uh, the 2010 recipient of the Everett and uh, Rogers Award to you. Uh, Martine is, um, is the founder of the uh, Center for Media and Health, uh, which she created in 1999 in the Netherlands. Um, and, um, uh, rep represents really a, 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 a sort of mosaic of contributions to this field. Um, uh, she's contributed in the production side, she's contributed in the program creation and conceptualization side, she's contributed in the research side of her, her doctoral dissertation, uh, Turtles and Peacocks, uh, is uh, much read as a, an insightful look at the program creation process. Um, and you can get that, by the way, by visiting her website. Perhaps she will uh, tell you uh, her website uh, as part of her talk. Uh, there are a number of things that she'd want to look at there, including some of the materials that she'll show you this afternoon. But in particular, I'd recommend to you um, the uh, journal article version uh, of Turtles and Peacocks, uh, which appeared as an article in Communication Theory and is downloadable from the site. But uh, Martine um, has also um, been a, uh, a staunch policy advocate in the area of entertainment education, uh, influencing governmental policy in the Netherlands, um, and to add to that, uh, has really taken an international lead in creating a curriculum to train the next generation of people to produce, conceive of, and evaluate uh, and improve the applications of entertainment education. So she really represents a, a model person to <coughs> academics and to what can be done on a, on a nationwide basis. I know the Netherlands is a small nation, but nations um, are complex entities to try and coordinate uh, educational policy in whatever their size. Uh, and uh, her center is, is really famous for, for creating uh, the infrastructure that enables the, the training and the education of the next generation of creators of entertainment education. So it's a great pleasure to introduce you to the 2010 a recipient of the Rogers Award, Dr. Martini Blumen. It's a great pleasure to be here with so many people who came specially for this uh, colloquium. Um, and of course, I feel very privileged and honored to be the sixth recipient of the Entertainment Education Award, named after Everett Rogers. And I'm so glad that one of the former recipients, David, is here, David Poindexter. And I know from the other two recipients, Arvind Singel and uh, Miguel Sabido, who I met uh, two weeks ago in Berlin, in Germany, that they would love to be here, but they were not able to be here, and they sent them, they sent us our, their regard. Um, of course, I also want to thank uh, the hosts of, uh, of this event. Uh, they invited me to come here in person to uh, receive the award. Marty Kaplan, as you already know, Norman Lear Center, Peter Clark from the University of Southern California, and Sandra de Castro Buffington from Hollywood Health and Society. I also would like to thank uh, Christina Felix, who did a wonderful job for the logistic details to bring me here and to keep me hosted here. So thank all of you. 
Um, the award is named after Everett Rogers. And um, as some of you may probably know, I have had the luck to meet him in person and to work with him on several occasions. Um, and I hold dear the first meeting that I had with him. It was a little bit of an awkward situation, I must say. Uh, it was on a beautiful morning in 1991. I was in Finland and I was participating in a North Karelia uh, health tour as part of a conference. And we went to the lobby to be there for the bus drive. And there was a distinguished gentleman sitting there. And he was clearly waiting for people. So I arrived in the lobby and I, um, um, I uh, st uh, stuck out my hand and I said to him, hello, my name is Martin Bauman. Uh, are you the bus driver? <laughs> And you know, I have, he smiled, he took my hand and he said, very nice to meet you, Mrs. Bauman. Uh, yes, we will be traveling together, uh, although I will not be driving. <laughs> so I was not sure what his role would be in this tour. So I started a conversation, you know, you're a little bit embarrassed, so you start a little bit social talk and... And then <clears throat> we joined uh, each other walking to the bus and then I told him that I was working in the health communication field and that I was specifically interested in the entertainment education strategy. Um, and I was talking with him about entertainment education and then I casually mentioned the Indian television series Humlog as one of the examples that was known to me. And then again, uh, this man's eyes started shining <laughs> and uh, he, s he stuck out his hand and he introduced himself and he said, hello, I'm F. Rogers and I know this Humlock project very well. Scholar, I believe I was the first scholar to try to measure the effects of entertainment education on um, audience members' knowledge and attitudes toward the educational issue and uh, actual behavior change. This was a study of the effects on family planning behavior in India of a, radio, of a television soap opera named Tom Logue in the mid-80s. So, um, of course, I was very familiar with the Humlock's writing and not recognizing uh, Ev in person was quite embarrassing, I must say. Um, so the next few days we talked a lot about entertainment education and you know Ev is a very busy person so I was so lucky that we had a North Karelia tour, we had three days to really exchange and um, at a certain point in time I asked him if he would be willing to consider to be a member of my, a uh, long distance member of my uh, PhD committee. And, uh, of course, Ev smiled again, and he said, well, I'm happy that I had such a rapid promotion from being a bus driver <laughs> to be part of your doctoral committee. And uh, so when I started to do my PhD in the University of Wageningen, uh, I discovered that Ev had a very um, strong ties with the Netherlands. And his relationship with the Netherlands, and especially with the Wageningen Agricultural University, went back for decades. So, again, the metaphor of uh, Ev as a bus driver is, is very suitable for him, because Ev, um, he guided many of us uh, on, his, on our entertainment education journeys, including mine. As we all know, he was very friendly, he was radiant, and he also was very inclusive. And he introduced me to several people who were already working in the entertainment education field. Uh, one of them was uh, uh, Arvind Singel, whom I met first in 1992 in New Delhi. Here you see a picture of a long time ago when we were in, in New Delhi. And of course, he later he introduced me to David Poindexter, to William Brown, Michael Cody. So a lot of people I got to know because of this kind introductions of Ev. I also remember um, 
the, my first spark. How that, did I get involved in entertainment education? Why did I start it, my journey on entertainment education? And it was um, in the early 80s. At that time, I was employed with the Netherlands Heart Foundation. And um, I saw a drama series on television. It was called Zeg is A, which means that's, that's a phrase you have to say when the doctor is looking in your throat. Zeg is A. Say A. Okay. Uh, and it was about a general practitioner, a woman who was a doctor, and she had a lot of uh, patients in her practice. And I really thought, wow, this is a good setting to introduce heart health themes, li lifestyle themes in such a drama series. But it was in 1992, uh, and four million people watched this series. No, it was even earlier. It was in the 80s. So four million out of 50 million people watched this series. Um, but of course, this series did not incorporate on uh, a plan a health communication message. And I thought, well, this is pity. We should really try to collaborate with the people in the entertainment industry. And um, because of my contacts with Ev, I've, I shared this with him. And he told me a lot about the potential of entertainment education. But he also said, well, entertainment education is also great fun. Well. Oh, yes, the fun parts. Uh, of course, it's a lot of fun to get high ratings, if it's a radio or television show, or to have a lot of people come. And uh, many of these programs have been unbelievably uh, popular. Uh, and the real payoff isn't just the number of people that are watching, viewing, listening, reading, whatever, uh, but it's the changes in their behavior. That's, of course, the real fun or elation that comes from uh, entertainment education. In fact, I guess it could go to your head, and then when you have an entertainment education program that's just good but not fabulous, and some are of that kind, uh, you know, they get average ratings and attract average audiences, but nothing unbelievable, uh, it's a little disappointing. Oh, well, this was only a good show, it wasn't a fabulous show. So you can almost get spoiled with your success. The fact that uh, there can always be a failure is probably what makes it all the more interesting. Uh, if there was no chance that it wasn't going to work. So there's enough uncertainty that you never know. And uh, then there's great fun, of course, if you find out that it's attracting a lot of people. And then further, that it is indeed changing people's behavior. Okay. So um, I realized that I would really like to explore more in-depth this entertainment education strategy as a kind of communication tool for the Netherlands Heart Foundation. And in those days, there were some significant epidemiological studies that there was a coming health inequality uh, in the Netherlands and also worldwide. So certain groups of people, they had a shorter life and the quality of life was not so high than other groups, which really um, amazed me. And I felt sorry for this and I thought, well, um, if that's the case, we should try to uh, create other types of methodologies to reach all kinds of groups so that they can benefit from the information that is there. And maybe entertainment education can be one of those strategies. So I started to explore this a little bit and then, of course, I had to talk with my board of directors at the Netherlands Heart Foundation, which is a very respectable, high esteemed medical organization who is not really into popular culture. I mean, at those days, uh, and I talk about the, the 80s, it was taboo to have an interview in a tabloid or to work with soap series or drama series because it, that could not be the real thing, you know. Um, so then I came across uh, the work of uh, Petty and Cacioppo. And some of you are familiar with this elabor elaboration likely hot model i show you just a very simple uh, decision matrix. And um, because of their work, uh, I understood that there are different routes for persuasion. There is a central route and there is a peripheral route at the right. And I knew that sometimes when people are not really interested yet in a health style of a healthy lifestyle theme or they are not trained to elaborate information, 
then it might be possible to choose for another way to persuade people to change their behavior. So this peripheral route uh, is one of the bases also for the entertainment education strategy and for me it gave some leverage to talk with my director and to talk with the board to say hey this is not just low culture and using low culture for fun no there is a reason behind that there are scientific studies that show us that uh, there are different routes to persuade people so this gave me a lot of leverage to got to get the green light the green light and the elaboration likelihood model is still used widely in entertainment education and there is even an extended elaboration likelihood model. So I got the green light of the Netherlands Heart Foundation for, uh, the director and management to experiment with entertainment education. And I deliberately called it an experiment because an experiment can fail. And nobody knew exactly at that time how to do it there were, of course, some articles, but they were very scarce. I, again, I talk about the late 80s. Uh, so there was this study on Hamlock, there were some other studies. Um, but most of the studies reported the research data, which is, of course, very important. Uh, and most of the studies were done in a non-Western setting. Living in the Netherlands, uh, trying to create these entertainment education uh, uh, interventions, I had to find a way to, to, make it ha to make it work also within a Western setting and a Western culture. And most of the articles don't mention also the difficulties behind the scenes and how you can collaborate, what you have to do, what are the criteria for designing an entertainment education program. So this is also a kind of pledge or plea to all of you, if you write articles about your work, it would also be very interesting for other people to see what were the difficulties, the failures behind the screen. So please feel free also to write about processes and about the learning things and about the mistakes that you made, the pitfalls, because otherwise other people fall in the same pitfall. Um, So, I already found out that if you really want to create entertainment education as a kind of planned intervention strategy, then it needs a lot of time. And it needs also uh, a lot of uh, serious planning. And I have agreed with this. It isn't easy to make a successful AE uh, project. Uh, it's much more difficult than having just an entertainment program or just an educational program. Um, and uh, the extra effort that's required is much more planning time uh, to plan it. And uh, I have, as an individual, I've never enjoyed planning things. I wanted to do them. But I have learned through the EE <laughs> projects I've been involved in that this months, and it often takes a year or more of planning uh, before there's even any production. Uh, and this amounts to doing formative evaluation to find out um, about the audience, uh, to plan the characters and the storyline and the script, and uh, also uh, to call together involved people, community leaders or national leaders, uh, including people who might oppose it if it's a sensitive issue. Uh, this all requires this long period of time and a certain amount of cost but I'm convinced that's quite worthwhile than in uh, a more effective program when one actually has it. And uh, I believe that almost all of the effective um, entertainment education projects of whatever channel they have used uh, have had that long period of planning. Has any one of you ever fancied to tango? This is a real question. Have you ever fancied to tango, the dance? Yes. You did? Yes. Wow. How many years? I, I won't go into that. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is very good that you tried to tango and that you experienced this. Are there any other people who tango? Wow. That's wonderful. So we know that um, 
that is a special dance. It has its own rituals, its own creativity. Um, and you could say it's a very subtle play. Uh, a play of leading by pacing and also a play of serving by leading. Um, well, entertainment education is like a tango. Um, only not with two. But in fact with three different disciplines. Maybe even more, but let's not make it too complicated. So you have the script writers, the creative media professionals on the one hand. You have the behavioral scientists on the other hand. And you have, of course, the subject matter experts. These three um, have to dance with each other. Well, you can see the picture, isn't it? <laughs> uh, so how many times will they step on each other's toe? <laughs> and who is leading who? And how much room is there to dance for each of them? Well, in the past 20 years, um, I was intimately involved with all kinds of uh, um, entertainment education partnerships and I soon learned by hard lessons, by making mistakes, that um, um, it's like dancing but dancing on eggshells. It really is a very subtle thing. I remember my first visit in, uh, at uh, the Animal Production Company, which is a big entertainment industry. They are the creators of Big Brother, whether you like it or not, but this is the entertainment industry in the Netherlands. And um, it was in 1988, I just jumped back in time all the time, um, and we were uh, creating a big show, a big game show on heart health issues. So I was a kind of delegate co-producer and I had to, adv ad to advise the, the producer how to deal with the health issues. And the moment I stepped into the room, for the meeting, I was taken apart by one of the producers and he said to me, Martine, please be careful with what you say and please be careful with the sensitive nature of our script writers. So I thought, oh my gosh, I was not, I, I didn't plan to say rude things or so, but <laughs> there is something that needs to be balanced here. So. I learned that it was really a kind of subtle interaction and subtle uh, uh, play. And when I talked this over with F, he recognized this uh, very well. And on several occasions, he referred to a metaphor that I used uh, in my work. And the other resistance, which is worldwide and is a problem to be overcome everywhere, is um, exemplified by uh, Martin Baumann's PhD dissertation title. Uh, the peacock and the turtle, the, the peacocks of the world, I believe she means, are the creative people, script writers, directors, producers. The, um, the turtles are the people like me, the scholars who do research on entertainment education, including formative research on where the audience is. Uh, many entertainment people uh, think that we turtles are too slow. That's why we're turtles, not peacocks. And uh, they also feel that we're interfering with their complete right to do whatever they want to do. And we are by saying, well, let's not forget the audience. Here's what we know about the audience. And let's not forget about this educational objective that we're trying to reach. Uh, so get rid of that cops and robbers scene. It has nothing to do with family planning in Tanzania, Tanzania let's say. So um, that is an inherent kind of uh, conflict. And it gets worked out, uh, but always with difficulty, uh, always with difficulty. And ultimately, it comes down to the creative people being shown or convinced that they can make a more effective program that will have greater impact on society. They all want to improve society. Uh, they don't want to make it worse. Um, and if collaborating with a turtle can you know, get the peacock toward what they want, then ultimately they will, at least to some degree, collaborate. So when I talk with uh, script writers during my PhD research, some of them um, said, well, this world is like a zoo with birds of different feathers. So that's why the, per the, t the, 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 the peacock metaphor came up. And they also said um, when they collaborated with a subject specialist or with, with a scientist, they said, well, he was like a turtle. 
showing his head now and then quickly, and then, no, showing his head now and then, and then quickly withdrawing when it became too dangerous. So when it, be when it became too popular or too edgy, then these people tended to drop out. So uh, that's why the turtle and the peacock metaphor is used in, 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 in my work now. But when I really talked to the producers and the, 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 the script writers, they also said, especially the producers and the, um, the di directors of the, the broadcasting organizations, they said, well, um, the more competent and intelligent our partners are, the more we like it, the more interested in the game. So they really like to have a kind of equal partnership in, uh, in this. So in the beginning, I had to learn the entertainment education work by really by doing things, and it was a hard way. So I made several mistakes, uh, as I already told you. For example, I mentioned the word education, uh, but entertainment <laughs> education, which is a big, big mistake. Yeah. You should never use this word. But <laughs> nowadays, I say, well, would you be willing to uh, to integrate a re uh, an actual theme which is now happening in society, which can create a nice uh, drama line uh, and, and, and contribute to important things that are going on at this moment, instead of uh, education. And also, um, we used to, to use the word target audiences. And target audience, it looks like you're just pushing your gun and you shoot someone because this is the one who want, you want to reach. But they talk about audiences or even about buyers if it's a commercial setting. Uh, so these are some different words and frames, and there are a lot of them. So if you really try to understand the language and the frames uh, that fit with a kind of nice collaboration ship, then you are far ahead. So the way I um, wanted to learn more about when to dance and how to step forward and how to withdraw yourself is also um, <coughs> by studying the theories of creativity. Because I really wanted to know what did I wrong? Why did I sometimes step on another's toe? Did I come too soon? Uh, I mean, had I wait? Uh, so I studied the theories of some of the theories of creativity, and this one is based on, on Getzel, and there are, of course, many, many other theories. But what I found so interesting to discover is, first of all, that you have different stages in a, in a creative process, but there are also these different brain modes. You have the left and the right brain modes. It's very, I mean, this is simplifying what I'm telling now. But the scientists among us, <coughs> we are more trained in a left brain mode. So we like linear things, we like logical things, we like digital, sequential, uh, syntactical uh, ways of approaching things. <coughs> While the creative people are uh, more uh, intuitive, they are more synthetic, they are nonverbal, perceptual. And if you see which stages of change, which stage of creativity link with these brain parts, with, of course, we all have a left and a right brain, by the way. It's not that we only have this one or that, but we are more trained in one or the other. So I learned from this that during this creativity, I should, for example, not interfere with a creator's, pro, uh, a script writer's work in the incubation stage. If I would knock on his or on her door when she's writing a script and say, hey, how are you doing? And can I already see what some of your work? Because my board of directors needs to have some answers. Then they will be very frustrated because they were just incubating, having a good glass of wine or even a joint in the Netherlands, and then they make a beautiful <laughs> script. So I learned just to uh, be there at the saturation stage, which is the research stage, and also at the end, because of course I wanted to check, did they do the work that we wanted, and, and did it serve some purpose? So this helped me very much. And of course there is a great difference between theory and practice. So another uh, interesting uh, theory that helped me in entertainment education uh, in the Netherlands was the work of the French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu. And I think many of you have may read him or heard of him. And he was the one who uh, wrote about these different fields. This, he had a general theory of practice. And what I found very interesting, 
he did some work on art and on, on, on science and, 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 uh, and he said, well, we have different forms of capital, economic capital, cultural capital and social capital. And um, every individual in every field strives to uh, maximize its form of capital. And if you are, for example, let's say in the media domain, uh, then you have the autonomy and the power to include people or exclude people. Um, so if you want to collaborate with the media, and or the other way around, if the media wants to collaborate with the health professionals, they also have their own field, with their own field of the game, with their own habitus, with their own rules and norms. <coughs> and if you don't understand these very well, then you, 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 it's difficult to enter this domain. So if there is a way to exchange capital forms that really uh, helps each other to uh, do your work better, better then there is a, a room for collaboration. Uh, for example, uh, the Netherlands Heart Foundation had a lot of um, members, support members of the foundation. So if we talk with a producer and we say, hey, if you, uh, we would like to collaborate with you, and uh, we will tell all our members, all our supporters, uh, that we work with you, then more than 800,000, which is a lot in the Netherlands, will watch your program. So your figure will, will, will rise. So this is the kind of non-economic uh, but symbolic capital that we take to the floor. Also, our, our respect, uh, our um, name and fame, we will bring to the floor. So in this way, you can exchange capital forms, which is very interesting. And um, I wrote this in my book, The People, uh, The Turtle uh, and the Peacock. And for you, it might also be good to know that we in the Netherlands have a strong public broadcasting system. We have a moderate uh, uh, commercial, uh, co commercialization, which helps, of course, to work with the creative media industry in, in Hilversum. Um, so I was able to make different entertainment education series in the Netherlands. For example, Villa Borghese, which was a 13-episode series of 15 minutes each. Uh, Medical Center Wedge, which was a hospital series. And um, I also was able to work with uh, Costa, one of the other series. Exactly 20 years uh, after I had my first visit at this entertainment uh, producer and the mall, I came back. It was in 2008. And uh, this time, the collaboration went very smooth. They didn't take me apart to warn me to be sensitive with the nature of the creative. <coughs> Somehow, those in the 20 years, a lot has happened. So what did we do to make this happen? Well, we created the Center for Media and Health. You see the dancing floor in the middle? <laughs> this is where all the people come together and have their tangos. Well, this is the way we, we intermediate between science, research, and policy when we create entertainment education uh, uh, interventions. And one of the things we did was to, yes, was to um, really try to figure out how script writers do their work. I really was interested sincerely in in, in how they write the scripts, how they find the characters, how they find the storylines, what the time restraints were, what the budget restraints were. So um, I applied for a grant. Uh, it's called uh, Health on Screen, this grant. And we received this grant from the Dutch Health Research Council to watch episodes of four different <coughs> drama series and to identify drama lines in this case, we chose the topic of sexual health because a lot of series have some reference to, health, to sexuality and health. Um, and we analyzed 14 drama lines that we discovered in these four series. But that was not that spectacular. What we wanted to do is to talk with the scriptwriters about these storylines. We talk with health communication professionals to see if they recognize some theoretical notions in these storylines. For example, uh, uh, social support, which is a kind of theoretical term that we use. But if I talk with a scriptwriter and I said, 
Could you insert some drama lines where you really see there is social support for this new behavior? Then they would think, what's she talking about, social support? Or when I talk about anticipated regret, which is a term we use in health communication, they don't know what it is. So I thought if I can show a short fragment of their own work and tell them, well, this is what we mean with social support, or this is what we mean with anticipated regret. Then they might say, okay, but we already do this. So marvelous, yes, we can collaborate because it's not something new, we already do it. So then I can go a little step further and say, wonderful to collaborate. We would like to help you to even make a better program. So I would like to show you a little clip of one of the uh, episodes of a series, it's called Costa, and uh, there are a few s young people who live in a house in the Costa del Sol, and their work is to go out in the street, flyer, and to get some tourists, some youngsters, to the discotheque to have party time there. So you I can imagine they live in the same house, so there's all kind of intrigues and social relationship within these groups in this house. Iedereen trapt er gewoon in. Overdag zijn we de perfecte proppers. S'nachts de perfecte minnaars. <laughs> Het kan dus wel, hè? Proppen en een relatie hebben. Mm -hmm. mm. Tommy, Tommy, als jij seks hebt met die Gabrielle, kan je dat toch gewoon tegen me zeggen? Er is niks gebeurd hoor. Tommy, we hadden een afspraak. Ik ben niet met haar naar bed geweest. Waar zijn die condooms dan gebleven? Heb je soms opgegeten? Waar ga je naartoe? Waar lijkt het op? Ik ben niet met haar naar bed geweest. Eten. Kom je ontbijten? Ik heb alles klaar gezet. Oh, lekker, dank je. Trouwens, mijn condooms zijn op. Zou ik er een paar van jou mogen? Kijk me zo van gisteren aan. Ik niet hoor. Ik niet hoor. Wie had ze hier niet aan de afspraken? Well, this is an example of a, a drama series element in which we collaborated with the scriptwriter because they, want, they had a movie in the cinema which was very popular in Belgium and in the Netherlands, so a lot of young people watched the movie, but there was no reference to safe sex practice, nothing. And there was a lot of hints to have sex with each other. So when they decided to make a drama series on television, we thought, it was a waste of, of broadcasting time and of opportunities not to make the reference to safe sex. So um, in this little fragment you see role modeling, you see um, liking heuristics, because they were very attractive soap series characters, you see interpersonal communication, because you can really speak up to each other, you have the condoms in place, uh, so there are different ways that we dealt with this issue in this series. And I was aware when I showed this in, um, in an earlier uh, guest lecture that this is maybe a Dutch culture. Maybe it's not something you could do in the United States. I'm not sure. But um, it is an example of how we created entertainment with an added value. 
What did we do else? We have our yearly um, annual day of the soap. <laughs> and you see some familiar faces. Do has been our guest. Uh, Arvin has been our guest. Sandra has been our guest. Uh, Bill has been our guest. So uh, a lot of um, people have attended the day of the soap. And what did we do is a kind of creating an, a day where scientists, where uh, producers, where students, where researchers come together and we really explore each other's boundaries and each other's work. Um, and this, um, I remember that at a certain point in time, um, one of the producers of Animal said to me, uh, Martin, and he has been there for five times on a row, now I understand what you mean with entertainment with an added value. And I want to be part of it. I want to contribute to changes in society, and this is a big company. So I was happy that because of this exchange, and it didn't happen overnight. I mean, there were five years in a row we organized the Day of the Soap, but gradually, you see, it becomes a kind of little community. People become a member of the, the web community, entertainment education web community. And um, some of them have even met here and uh, started to collaborate in other countries. So it is a kind of platform really to create together this uh, community. When I heard this producer saying, now I know what you mean, uh, what is entertainment with an added value, I knew, okay, with you, I want to collaborate with you in the next project. And the next project is a hearing loss uh, campaign. We designed a hearing loss campaign in the Netherlands to help young people to decide whether they go to the clubs and the discotheque without or with earplugs and to be close to the boxes or further away to the boxes because there's a new epidemi uh, epidemic coming on that a lot of young people have already uh, problems with their hearing at a young age so when they are 50 they might be impaired and they have to wear uh, things in their ears. Um, so I would like to show you a little trailer of this uh, series, and it is a web-based drama series. We'll call it now Webisodes. Uh, we designed it in 2008, uh, and it, again, it was part of a multimedia, large cross-media kind of uh, uh, setting. Um, the series is also about a young boy who is a music maker. He makes music samplings. And he's discovered by a famous VJ, and she invites him to be, to, to give his music, um, to, to integrate his music in her new uh, CD. But he says, no, you are too commercial, I'm really an artist, so I don't want to give my music to you. But, of course, at a certain point in time, they start to like each other, there is romance in the air, and, um, well, you will see. Het is een wijd party. Nee, ik ga niet. Nou, kom op, man. Dat is best vet niet. Hey, hey, best vet! We zijn nu voor plan vanaf. Je hebt nooit meisjes, dus, dus ik moet toeslaan. Precies. Heb je misschien zin om met mij wat te gaan drinken? Een pijn is eigenlijk een teken dat het te laat is. Heb je er al gezien? Nee. Wat moet zo met iemand met de gehoord blijven? Hey, leuk dat je er bent. Je is uh, Frank, mijn manager. Hey, hey jongen. Hey, hey. Ik krijg je niet aan mijn kop. Okay, this is a trailer. We put this on YouTube three weeks before the release, so that was a kind of gossip. So, who is there? One of the favorite characters in other series was in this series. They were all famous uh, soap stars. So, there was a kind of rumor spread around. Is there a new series? We want to see it. And this was really for us a tryout. And also there, of course, we made mistakes. Because one of the things I learned from this, we called it a web soap, an internet soap. And the word... Every episode was two, two and a half minutes. Uh, and by calling it a soap, the boys, the, 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 the male uh, youngsters, 
they didn't feel connected with this idea of a soap. Well, it was not really a soapy because it was filmed outside and it was in between a film and a soap. So I learned from this a lot. And now we are creating a new internet series uh, which is also referring to, to going out and have uh, f uh, to your leisure activities in the weekends. Uh, and it will be based on transmedia concepts and 360 degree storytelling with a lot of new media and blogs connected. So this is our next uh, project. Um, yes, looking where I came from and what has happened in this last uh, 10 years, um, I think that we all experience that it needs time to, to shift from one stage into another. And Ev also. Uh, one of the greatest pools of resistance to entertainment education is in Hollywood, my, in my own country. Uh, and when we show them evidence of the successes of entertainment in other countries, they say, yes, but the conditions there are different than in the United States. We have more competition. Uh, we have a media-saturated audience so that any single message on any particular channel is not going to attract a lot of people and so on. Uh, so the, tough, the toughest resistance is probably in my own country, in Hollywood, and, and that hasn't really been cracked yet, although there are a few people in Hollywood trying to do something about that, and there are a few people that in their way have done something to use entertainment education, but never in the rather complete way that it's been used uh, in Europe and in the world, especially in the developing countries of Latin America, Africa, and Asia. Uh, these are people who feel that, uh, well, they're, they're commercially oriented, so they don't care about the, uh, the educational side. So if there's any greater cost to doing entertainment education, they're not interested. It's, it's pretty much that simple. But that was 10 years ago. That was in the past. And now, thanks to Hollywood Health and Society, the Norman Lear Center, and other players in the field, there are so many successes now in Hollywood. And I think Ev would really smile and be very happy with all this progress that has been made here, especially in Hollywood. So you see, um, a lot has happened um, since the turtles and the people started to sniff to each other and started to dance. Um, and this, this metaphor of the den still characterizes uh, uh, my work. Um, and I would like to invite all of you to uh, have the pleasure and the joy to uh, bridge uh, different gaps and to play this game of really respectful game. It's not playing with each other, but it's really trying to find out who are you, what is your expertise, uh, how do you do your work? Can I help you somewhere? And make things uh, work together. And that's what we also did with creating entertainment education teaching modu modules in the Netherlands. So we have six universities, six organizations who now train students in becoming skilled uh, entertainment education uh, collaborators and to invite them um, on the dance floor. And to conclude, um, I'm happy that um, uh, the interaction with the per turtles and the peacocks is also shared by the one and only. I have uh, enjoyed working with creative people, with the peacocks of the world, and I've learned a great deal from them. Never enough to ever fool myself that I could do anything creative myself. I'm happy to be a turtle. I keep on crawling along at slow pace like turtles should. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Smoking the joint, <laughs> doing the tango with a turtle. <laughs> um, we're going to spend, I know some people have classes to go to, but we are going to spend some time uh, taking, uh, Martin will take some questions. Could I ask first, are there any undergraduates here? Yes. Would you like to ask a question? Oh, no. <laughs> All right, you had your time. Okay. Um, uh, the floor is open for questions. Yes, sir. Hi. 
thank you for your presentation and the work. Um, I've been familiar with it and getting more familiar with it. I'm wondering about, the, just in terms of this idea of shared capital, whether you're aware of something that's come out of San Francisco, actually last year, a group called Active Voice. You know who they are? Have you heard about them? A little bit, but not so much. Why I'm putting this in is they put together something called a prenup, and it is a five-page document which is to be submitted both to those people who are the social scientists and investors and to the artists about the process of making any movie or video and allows you to actually ask questions to each other that are appropriate so that the shared capital works. So I want to share this to anybody here this group who's aware of it. It's called prenups and the organization's called Active Voice. And, uh, they, uh, Were they at a conference in San Francisco in 2008? They may have, I'm not sh I, I have no idea. I know them because I know this particular project and I know what they've done and it is an excellent, excellent model for anybody who's trying to have a dialogue where the peacocks and the turtles now actually have the appropriate questions to ask each other. Thank you. Good. Other questions? Or comments? Sorry. Yeah, I, have, I have a curiosity, if I may go back to your digital uh, presentations. Two and a half minutes distributed on what media? How do they get out there? It is, uh, uh, of course, on YouTube. You have to put it on YouTube. But it is within the website, soundsoap.nl. And this is, we created two websites, one for the peripheral route. So one was based on the soap series, and the other on the central route, which was called Go Out Plug In. So we, the payoff of everything was go out plug in. So it, you could see it on the website. Uh, and we made some free cards in discotheques uh, and in dance uh, event uh, places so that you can see, for example, a quote from one of the episodes on the free card. And then at the back we said, see you at www.soundsoap.nl. Could they pick it up on phones? Not yet. That will be the next possibility. And because we, we, we discussed this, but sometimes you need to pay for this. And we had the experience that uh, in other projects that um, children or young people uh, were charged money for this, and we didn't want to get into that. And how many episodes did you actually produce of this? In this, we created uh, 10 episodes, which together makes a kind of 20, 25 television series. So we can also... Uh, re-edited it and then it is a complete television uh, product also. That's how we did it. And did you get any measure of, of uh, how, how, it, how popular it was? Yes, we did of course our Google Analytics uh, analyst, but we also um, um, did a whole pre-post control study on the whole campaign. So there was also the other elements which included the sound series and um, uh, we were very happy that there were positive changes in attitude and also in self, um, self efficacy and in risk perception in favor of the intervention group that we had in, in Amsterdam. So, do you look? It is, you can download all the Dutch reports. So, if you find a Dutch person in your neighborhood, you can <laughs> read everything. To, and I have not had the time yet to write a peer reviewed English article. And I'm very sorry for that. Just in continuation of the same thing. Nice job, Martin. Thank you. Um, how do you draw people to this YouTube video? How do you get your audience to know it's there? Well, this is something that we will even... Um, uh, uh, we learned from this process. Because I asked uh, an organization who was very familiar with social media to do this for us. Um, but they were not in our office which means that sometimes I didn't know how they were working with, with big uh, web communities, uh, how they were um, collaborating with um, uh, uh, offline, on, yeah, online uh, journalists. So at a certain point of time, we decided we have to do this work also within the center because it really is very subtle. So we had, for example, a press conference at entertainment uh, uh, the animal production company. So there was online press, offline press, radio and television. But because it was an entertainment education series, we didn't really want to uncover the theme mm -hmm. to really be very specific about it. Because otherwise, maybe the 
the youngsters would read in the, the tabloids and in the, the papers new internet series about hearing loss. And then we would maybe lose the, 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 our audiences. And this was very difficult because we, we wanted to share that it was an entertainment with an added value and we didn't want to hold back information from the press. So we had a press conference, but it was one of the most difficult moments in my life when I had to explain what we were doing without telling them. Yeah. <laughs> Joe? Um, you have this idea of the three to tango, and it sometimes strikes me that besides the peacocks and the turtles, you have this group called the donors. Yeah. Uh, you know, which yeah. I don't know. They are quite <laughs> but they have tremendous power in the system of this exchange, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your experience with that in terms of facilitating these very different modes and values about what's important. Yeah. <coughs> well, um, the issue of power is very important. If you study health communication, you will never find a chapter on power relations. Um, so when I studied really this whole process of collaboration, I was really interested in this negotiated struggle between different power positions. That's why Bourdieu is so very interesting. Uh, when I collaborated with uh, producers, I was a delegate producer from the Netherlands Heart Foundation, and we had our own funding, so I really took, take, took care of that part. So sometimes my board of directors, of course, wanted me to tell, okay, Martine, what are you doing there and how is it evolving? So one of the criteria that I mention also in my book is that you have to have a good backing, that really the people behind you must support you because um, there is a lot of money sometimes involved for the research and for things. Um, and if you don't, you're not a good player, if you don't have a feel for the game and you're not socialized in this world, it can be a waste of money too. But of course, you must not have the attitude who pays uh, decides. That's not a good attitude. So um, the role of the donor is, uh, I think, the one who decides about the proposal, about the whole intervention project. And then you have, of course, to, to give them feedback afterward, but not during the process. And it would be a mistake if they really would force the, the message into the drama line, then it would not be an organic thing. And I have made that mistake too, because I wanted to please my directors and the Heart Foundation and the board. So at a certain point I thought, when is the heart health issue mentioned in the drama line of Villa Borghese? We had 12 episodes. When do you come up with the storylines about this? You cannot do it the first one. But after four drama episodes, I thought, now the the message should be there, otherwise I have nothing to show in the end. So I went through 25 years of process and now I know what to do and not, not to do, but of course, and I hope that everybody will not make the same mistakes as I have done and learn from, uh, from what we learn. Yeah. When you talk about, you talk about exchanging capital, yes. how does um, media and health exchange capital, capital with the writers and producers? and with the public health subject matter experts in creating the entertainment education. What's your role in that area? <coughs> well, um, um, Bourdieu says there is an interest in disinterestedness, which is an interesting word. Uh, and, and Bill had a wonderful presentation at one of the guest lectures about celebrities. Sometimes celebrities, they give their exposure for a good cause, for free. But of course, they have in mind that it will hire the revenues because there is an increasing of their symbolic capital. So, and that, that is also with, uh, with um, entertainment, uh, the, in the entertainment industry. Sometimes they want to have this, uh, this profile of being sustainable or of being uh, pro-social, of contributing to society. Uh, so when uh, respected organizations like the Cancer Institute or the CDCs or the health or, uh, heart health organizations collaborate with them, then it gives them more profile uh, and you, you bring in your capital because you have an enormous network, you have an enormous image and an, an enormous uh, goodwill. Uh, and of course, it's also tricky because you don't want to lose the goodwill. And that's what happened. I mean, it didn't happen, but that was why I was so afraid when I started in the 80s and it was not, it was a taboo to work in low culture uh, things. 
that um, on the one hand we got our money from the people in the Netherlands for heart health research because we were so respected, we were so medical bulwark, which high esteemed. And on the other hand, we spent it on soaps. So you saw the, 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 the publications, why is the Heart Foundation spending money on soaps? And we could, we could explain it. But we could not, of course, explain it in a clear way, in a sense of, well, because we want to reach less um, uh, hard to reach groups, because nobody would really understand. Journalists wouldn't be so subtle to really play with this information. So um, yes, this, uh, this is a kind of every time leverage in how do you bring in your capital. Uh, and if you can bring viewers to your program by having a big uh, uh, community, uh, then it also helps you to collaborate because they want high viewer rate for their advertising. Bill? Is this an answer? Yes. Martin, some of the social capital that you're providing is um, giving media professionals tools to, to help them succeed not only in their profession but also in impacting society. I know you're doing seminars and workshops and maybe you can tell everybody a little bit about that. I think that's an important dimension of, of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Well, um, it is, we, we try to create a kind of community where everybody is feeling a little bit more comfortable in collaborating with each other. So we, we said, okay, let's start with the students, uh, the students who study health communication, uh, media studies, um, uh, communication studies. Um, and um, also when we organize workshops or sometimes we create a panel on a conference, then I invite someone of the media industry to join me and then we are like together, Turtles and Picos together as a team presenting on conferences. conferences. And um, then we can um, uh, explain a little bit how this exchange of capital works and how we really influence each other in a nice and creative uh, way. So, um, it's, it's important not to have these boundaries around your own domain. Uh, and uh, because of the teaching modules in the Netherlands, there are different universities. And normally, sometimes universities want to create uh, a master's program and hope that others don't create this master's program because they need their students. But we have no interest in that type of thing. We are independent. Uh, so we can create these teaching modules for different universities. And it happens sometimes that, for example, I'm, I'm linked to the University of Twente, that the students of Twente do research for the uh, script writers from the Media Academy, uh, Academy who had some workshop with us on their drama series. Or um, the, the, the students from the University of Amsterdam do research for a health organization that we invited to create a kind of um, uh, briefing for an entertainment education intervention. So it's really everybody is working together now in a way uh, without having this kind of uh, protectionism or this, this uh, competition or and maybe because we, we, we are an independent organization from outside. So and we have the skills and the knowledge to, to create the modules. So they are hoping that we work with them uh, and we love to work with them but there's not a competition involved. After the drama series aired, was it possible to do follow-up studies to measure the impact of the message? I'm just going to repeat that because of the recording. So maybe you'd like to say it louder? After Stand up. <laughs> after the drama series aired, was it possible to do follow-up studies to see what the impact of the message was? Yes, there were several projects where I was involved in. In Costa, that was part of Health on Screen. That was not a research project, as we normally would say. But for example, in Villa Borghese, that was the first drama series I was involved with, a real entertainment education series that was in the early 90s. We had this pre-post control design, and we also studied it after six a week. Uh, and also in Medical Center West, it was a hospital series. Uh, where we incorporated several drama lines. And uh, there we had a post study, but what we did there, because we didn't have a pre-post control group, uh, we created uh, three intervention groups, one 
who is a fan from this series. Sometimes you are a fan of a series. So one group was, were fans of the series, one group were fans of the series, but didn't see the specific episodes which exposed this health information. And the other group were non-fans. So what we measured, that there was a difference between fans, you could see there was a similar group, uh, between those who had seen the episode and those who were, had not seen the episode because they were sporting or they had an anniversary somewhere. So this was a way also to create a kind of control group, but within a post-study. And um, so we did several pre-post control studies, uh, but it also, of course, depends on if you get the money for research. Uh, and I think it's very important if you have money for research, but it's limited, then I always say, please spend it on formative research first, because if you, the quality of your input is not highly enough, then you will not measure results. But it's more sexier to have an effect study than a formative study. <laughs> also when you want to publicize in peer-reviewed peer journals, which I think is a pity that, that there's so much focus only on this. It's nice if you have both of them. Um, uh, you spoke about ways of conveying the message that sort of grease the wheels when working with peacocks, that we're not going to say the word education, we'll talk about social issues. Is there another way to facilitate the pitch by appealing to certain issues or to certain audiences? Are the producers with whom you work more interested in reaching certain people or in talking about certain things? And if so, does that complement your interest or diverge? And do you ever find yourself facing ethical issues in that regard? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I remember that um, once said a scriptwriter to me, he said, Martine, we cannot dramatize a meatball, <laughs> in which what he said is we cannot make nice drama dialogues on food, nutrition. <coughs> I think he can, but it's a way, do you want it? And do you really find a way to be creative enough to do this? So there are, of course, certain issues which are more popular than others. Uh, and in the Netherlands, for example, we, want, we will pay more uh, um, in the future, uh, not only on health communication, but also on sustainability, and also on ethnic and racial tolerance, social justice, because that's a very important issue for the future and also for the present. Um, and um, because of this public broadcasting system we have, there is a mandate that the public broadcasters uh, have to make programs which have an informative value added. And sometimes I say to them, well, if you want to compete with uh, the commercials, then you can create entertainment education programs which are entertaining, but also have this information and educational value which you have to, uh, to you, you have to meet these demands from the government. So then entertainment education can help them to even compete with the commercials. Uh, and I've never been in a position yet, but I was to think, uh, about ethical dilemmas. Sometimes you, you uh, let's see. Of course, sometimes they, they, they um, incorporate a part of your message which is not really what you, what you were looking for. Mm -hmm. But then it means that you were not really co-producing. So the best is when you create it together from scratch on. That's what I love most. Mm -hmm. But if you have in-script participation, then the characters are already there. So in Costa, for example, in one of the episodes, they had a very nice storyline also about um, uh, safe sex practice. But the, the line was connected to not the most popular character in the series. It was a little bit a foolish girl who was making some foolish remarks. So I thought, <laughs> and we also had in hospital series, medical center, where's one who had a, a stroke. Um, but of course, it was one of the main characters who had a stroke because he wanted to have it very appealing for the audiences. But you cannot have a character having a stroke in all the episodes that come afterwards. So this, this person had to be cured in some way because 
it was a problem otherwise. Martine has graciously agreed to continue the questions and conversation uh, after for those who can stay. I just wanted to, to tell you all this evening, uh, Hollywood Health and Society is uh, putting on an award ceremony, uh, the Sentinel for Health Awards, which are being given on behalf of the Centers for Disease Control to the television stories, storylines, writers and producers who have done great work in including accurate and timely health messages in their stories. So we are honoring them. And as I said, at the Writers Guild, and at the very beginning of that event, and this is why I don't have a trophy to pass, the award will be presented to Martine right there, which is to say, inside the birdcage. <laughs> Thank you so much, Martine. You're welcome. Great to be here. Thank you very much.